how people shuffle in. Um, so, of course, welcome, welcome back to, to week three. Uh, today we're going to be talking about, so last week I spent a, I spent a good deal of time trying to explain qualitatively what quantum mechanics looks like, why it's different from regular classical physics that we think of, you know, when you think of throwing a ball, but it was mostly focused on looking at one particle at a time, looking at one electron, one photon, that type of thing. And today, what we're going to talk about is what happens when you have a whole bunch of atoms stuck together in one place, and it's still quantum mechanical. Um, before I start, I just want to remind everyone here that because of the fact that there is a uh, Leo Kavanaugh Memorial Symposium next week, and there will not be a lecture here, there will be a lecture the week after, though. But so there's no Compton lecture next week, just to, to make sure that people remember. I don't want people to show up and then not have anything to do here. So let's get started. So as, as I said, the question is, in quantum mechanics, what happens when you have a whole bunch of atoms, and you put them together, and they're interacting? So let's talk about what type of materials we're talking about. There are lots of different things. You can think of solids, liquids, gases. Uh, everything that I'm going to be talking about today, I'm interested in solids and really actually nice things that look crystalline. So here's a nice new little chunk of quartz. and. That's what it looks like. And if you zoom in really close, of course, you have a bunch of silicon atoms, oxygen atoms stuck together in some very pretty three-dimensional ionic lattice. And it just happens to be the case. If you take that piece, you zoom in really close, what you have is you have a bunch of different types of atoms. And they're bonded together in a rigid lattice structure. So a fair question is, well, first of all, what's holding these atoms together, right? You know. These atoms, there, there, there is a nucleus that's positively charged. There are a bunch of electrons flying around outside of it that are negatively charged. So why, when we take them and put them together and let it get very cold, does it form this nice structure? And of course, the right person to answer that would be a chemist, and really, you know, a, a, a crystallography chemist, which is not what I am, but I'm going to, you know, t tell you it in as, as as good details as I can, which is the following. So who here remembers when they took chemistry in high school? Okay. So, so what do we know? Okay, if, if what you might or might not remember from chemistry class is let's think of the simplest molecule you can build in chemistry, and that's a hydrogen molecule. But a hydrogen molecule is not just one hydrogen atom; it's two stuck together. And the story that is often told in uh, in, in a chemistry class is okay. Here's my kind of fuzzy quantum mechanical picture of a proton, and then there's this kind of electron cloud surrounding it. And if I, as I move them together, there's uh, the charged electrons and protons interact. And what you actually f find if you say, okay, what's the, what's the lowest energy, most stable state that these two electrons can get in if I bring them together, is that the two electron uh, wave functions become overlapping, right? There's not just this hydrogen atom's electron over here and this hydrogen atom's electron over here. They're really both spread out across both of them, and you form what is called a covalent bond. Covalent because these two atoms are sharing two electrons. And so this is kind of the chemistry picture, and at least when I took chemistry, this was just something you were told. It was a rule, and it worked. But since we know about quantum mechanics, we know why this actually happens. And the answer is pretty basic. If you just say solve Schrodinger's equation for two electrons in the background of two heavy protons, remember when we're talking about atoms, you can always essentially assume that the nuclei of the atoms are so much heavier than the electrons that to leading order, those things are not going to move. The, the electric uh, interaction between an electron and a proton is not going to be strong enough to move the ion, or the, the nucleus, but it will be able to affect where the electrons go. So you have this problem. You have to solve Schrodinger's equation, which tells you how quantum mechanical particles look in this background. It's, it's tricky. You can do it. The easiest way to do it is you just throw it on a computer and say, computer, solve my math problem for me. And it turns out that, indeed, what ends up happening is that the lowest energy solution is that these two electrons have wave functions that are spread out around both of the molecules. Now this should sound troubling because last week I talked all about Pauli exclusion principles and the fact that two 
well, two fermionic particles, like an electron or a proton or a neutron, can't be in the same place at the same time, or really, in a quantum mechanical sense, they can't be in the same state at the same time. But of course, we also know that electrons have spin. They can be spin up or spin down. And so what ends up happening is that roughly each spin is some combination of up and down in a way that's orthogonal. You can crudely think of it as one of the electrons is basically all spin up, and the other electron is basically all spin down in some way that they're really not in the same state anymore. That's not quite technically true, but it's, it's, it's pictorially true, uh, in the sense that the spin configuration of each of the electrons are orthogonal, so they're not in the same state. I'm sorry, yeah. but there's, that's not saying that electron on this side is never an electron. Both electrons have their quantum mechanical wave functions have support surrounding both molecules. Sorry, surrounding both uh, nuclei, um, and you can also check via via some basic uh, kind of calculations that the lowest energy configuration is not when these guys are on top of each other, but when there is some fixed width apart. And if I try to pull the nuclei apart from each other or push them together, there's an energy cost, and so. Qualitatively, it basically looks like there's a spring connecting the two nuclei. Of course, it's not a spring, it's some complicated quantum state, but this is basically how you, how you build a molecule. But this is one molecule, right? You know that covalent bonds are the things that let you take two hydrogen atoms, stick them on an oxygen, and get a water molecule. But this is still just basically one particle, right? I have you know, all of four elementary particles here. That's not a macroscopic system. Right? If we want to talk about solid state physics, we really need to have a lot of things all stuck together. So, a particularly fun and, and easy to picture example is something called graphene. You've probably heard of graphene because in 2010, uh, Novoselov and, and Gaim won a Nobel Prize for their experimental work with graphene. And what is graphene? The way they made graphene, and this is absolutely true, is they take a chunk of graphite, which is just a chunk of a, a rock of carbon, they took scotch tape, they put the tape on the chunk of graphite, peeled it off, and then put it on some, uh, they put it on some piece of uh, metal to, to lay it down on. And the idea is that you really only pick up effectively a two-dimensional sheet of carbon atoms. Right? This is fully three-dimensional, it's a big solid object, but when I put the tape on it and pull it off, I get a simple two-dimensional sheet. Which is nice because it makes it easier to draw pictures. So what does it look like? Uh, here is what it looks like. It's this beautiful, perfect hexagonal lattice of a whole bunch of carbon atoms sharing covalent bonds with neighboring sites. And pictorially, the carbon atom looks like this. There, there are uh, electrons on it that are going to form bonds and bonds and electrons that aren't. So let's zoom in. Okay, let's just study this one uh, carbon atom right here. I can identify all of the pieces. These yellow electron orbitals are going to form the covalent bonds, and the purple ones are going to be basically free electrons, and there are two of them because it can be spin up or spin down. Okay. Now, the electrons that are forming these covalent bonds are really rigidly stuck in there, right? We said they basically act as springs, but the electrons, the spin up and spin down electrons here, are not stuck there, and they're free to hop around. I can take one, and I can ask, well, maybe it hops to this other site over here. All right? And I have these electrons that are not rigidly bound to their nuclei at all of these sites. Okay? So that sounds like an extremely complicated problem, right? I have a whole bunch of electrons, they're all interacting, and they're all hopping around, and it's a mess. So we're gonna we're gonna cheat, basically. We're gonna we're gonna simplify the problem. Electrons are charged, and they repel each other just as they're attracted to the positively charged nuclei. It turns out that when you have a lot of electrons around, and they're all free to move about independently, they will rearrange themselves in a way to basically screen electric field lines, and, and essentially try to negate the charge-charge interactions between electrons. So electron-electron interactions are, are weakened by this screening process. 
And so to leading order, we're just going to assume that we can ignore electron-electron interactions, and we are only going to keep track of how each individual electron feels that background lattice of nuclei. Okay? This is an approximation, but it works very, very well in, in, in many, many materials. So what this means now is that we've taken our complicated system of many, many electrons, and to leading order, we've simplified it to the types of things we looked at last week, which is just acting, asking, what does one electron hopping around look like? So that picture of graphene is kind of complicated. It's two-dimensional. So I'm going to restrict myself to a much simpler system, a, a toy model. It's something called a quantum wire. I'm basically assuming I have a one-dimensional array of atoms, all stuck together in a chain. You can build these, of course, in, in laboratories. It's not impossible. And the idea is the following. So this is, this is the picture. It, it's crude. I've made it much cleaner than an actual quantum wire looks like. But the idea is that you have Schrodinger's equation. Schrodinger's equation has a potential, right? Now, I know that it, if I have an electron near a nucleus, it wants to fall down and get close to the nucleus, right? because they're attracted, and that means that at each nuclei, there's a deep potential well compared to in between, right? The idea being that this is like a potential, so if I have the electron here, it wants to fall down into this hole, or it wants to fall down into this hole, or it wants to fall down into this hole. And so you have to solve Schrodinger's equation with this nice periodic background potential, right? Which is mathematically no different than solving Schrodinger's equation for the hydrogen atom, where I would only have basically one of these wells. But this is already a complicated problem. So let's zoom in on a particular part of it, right? We're just going to say, what does Schrodinger's equation look like just right here, near the edge of one of these wells? And it turns out that if I ask, OK, so here again is my picture. This is the potential v of x in Schrodinger's equation. And this is, again, in a real material, it is not this sharp, well-defined thing, but when I draw it this way, it makes solving the problem easier, and qualitatively, it's the same. So this is the electrostatic potential from the background ions. And when you solve Schrodinger's equation, you find the following, okay? Deep in the well, the electron has non-trivial support, so this is kind of a pictorial drawing of uh, the wave function. And you see that in this region here, there are plenty of places where the wave function is non-zero, which means that uh, there's, a, there's a large probability for the electron to be found in this well. Whereas in between the wells, where there's this big potential wall, the wave function gets suppressed. So there's very, very little probability to find it in there. <coughs> Not zero, but very little. And if we kind of use our intuition for what this looks like, you could say, well, for my quantum wire, what do solutions look like? And again, crudely and qualitatively, you find that the wave function has support in the wells and very little support between the wells. It's not zero in here, because we know quantum mechanically electrons can tunnel from one site to another, but it's much, much smaller. OK? Question. Yeah? Are these um, near zero values, almost zero values, are these related to the, this concept that uh, I've heard over the years of uh, eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, or proper values and proper functions, or, or the so 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 when I, when I so when I solve Schrodinger's equation, I'm solving it in in yeah. But what I'm looking for is in a mathematical sense, I'm looking for eigenfunctions of the Schrodinger Hamiltonian operator, and the and the eigenfunction for the, for this case is this. So this is some state at fixed energy. And so, in the mathematical sense, the energy is the eigenvalue of the problem, and this wave is the eigenfunction or eigenvector of the problem in a linear algebra sense. And, and this is what explains the, uh, the jumps between states of energy that, that uh, is it the same principle or same concept? When so, so, what we're going to find here is that while there is stratification to the energies of states we have, it's not actually fully discretized, but we'll, we'll get into that later. But the, the idea is basically, for here, I want the takeaway to be the electrons really look like they can live in the wells and not outside of the wells, but because the wave function isn't exactly zero, there is a sense in which quantum mechanically, if I have an electron here, it can tunnel to the site next door. And there's some small probability of it. Can I have one question based on that? I think you were alluding to that. The energy 
energy levels, and there only be certain energy levels for electrons to jump up. So, so does that mean uh, a different energy level? Does that mean it can never be in between those energy levels? Or the probability is non-zero, but close to zero? No, so when you, when you solve Schrodinger's equation to find what the energy spectrum is, that's not a probabilistic statement. Those are the only energies that are allowed for a given system. And, you know, so think, think, of, think of, again, the energy levels for the hydrogen atom, right? There's a fixed level for the first shell and a fixed energy level for the second shell, which tells me that if I have a decay from, from 2 to 1, that always has the same energy. Right. So, so this is a picture. Of course, for, for some systems, there may only be room for, say, two electrons, because the electron could be spin up and near or spin down, or it may be more complicated. So what we're going to do is we are going to take a particular approximation called the tight binding approximation, and we're basically going to ignore the fact that this is really some complicated continuum wave function here, and I'm only going to care about what the, basically the value of the wave function as a fixed number in each well is. So there's just some large probability in here, small in here, and I'm basically going to effectively say the probability to find it here is zero, because it's, it's close enough to zero, as long as we make sure our system accounts for the fact that if I do have an electron here, it is allowed to tunnel next door. So what does that picture look like? It looks like the following. Okay. So the approximation is that in the walls, the wave function is zero, and in between it has some fixed values. So here, you know, it's psi and i, i plus one, i plus two, etc. And this means that we don't have a wave function. It's not a function of a continuous variable like position anymore. It's a function of basically an integer, right? Am I in potential well one, or two, or three, and so on and so forth. And so you go from this picture to something much cleaner, right? I just have a wave function at each site. And, and what that really means is that the state is described by a vector. If this wire is infinitely long, it's an infinitely long vector, which is a little weird, but that's, there's nothing really wrong with that. Basically, the entire state is described by what the wave function's value is at each site. So it's just this infinitely long list of, of, of wave function values in each site. And so in particular, if I want to know the probability to find the electron in one of these sites, it would just be the magnitude squared of this particular component. Any questions so far? Yeah? Uh, what is it that, what force or information is it that causes some particles to be entangled and others not to be? Mm -hmm. Um, so, so here in this model, as long as I allow in, I'm not going to get into the details of this, but here I'm just telling you kind of what the basic setup is, but to tell you the dynamics of the system, I have, to, I have to tell you what the Hamiltonian is. The Hamiltonian is the thing that tells me that how I take a particular state and evolve it in time. So if my Hamiltonian says that electron sitting here is never allowed to hop to any other site, then you'll never find entanglement between two different sites. If my Hamiltonian says that electrons here can hop to neighboring sites, then they will end up entangled. And we know intuitively from that picture that since the actual wave function isn't exactly zero in between here, I do have to allow for hopping. So this is a little complicated. Um, having this infinitely long vector describing the state is complicated and messy, and it's much easier to work in what's called a momentum basis, uh, instead of this discrete position basis, uh, which, which involves something called Fourier transforming. Um, I'm going to take this function of positions and <coughs> decompose it into a sum over different simple waves, right? So waves are just going to be sine or cosine waves. And these coefficients tell me how much of each wave I need to, to add together to make up this thing. So what do I mean by that? So he, I'm, I'm going to just do this very pictorially. Who here is actually reasonably familiar with Fourier transforms? Okay, good. So you guys will be a little bored by this, but that's okay. So here's just some generic function I picked that goes from zero to pi. It's zero at both ends, and it's nice and smooth. It's well behaved. Okay. Now what do we want to do? What did I say I wanted to do? 
I wanted to take this and decompose it into a bunch of different waves. So here is the function I'm interested in, and here's a set of a bunch of waves. Here's a wave that just has one wave between the two ends. Here's one that oscillates twice, three times, four times, etc. And I can stick as many waves as I want in between zero and pi. I'm just decomposing this function into different wavelengths, and I'm going to add them all back up together. So this sounds a little weird. So what does it look like? Okay, so first of all, I'm going to tell you that so I have this function here, and I know that if I add up each of these different plots with different heights assigned to them, I can reconstruct this. Okay, so what does that actually look like? So first, let me get this to animate. That went way too fast. All right, so here, that's the first wave, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and blah, 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 blah. And you might not believe this, but if I took all of these functions and added them all up together, I would reproduce that original plot I told you. And that's the basis of Fourier transforming. And so let's just see that happen. That went again way too fast. So there, okay, here, the black curve is the function we're trying to reconstruct. And the red curve is going to be summing up the first few waves. So I have just that first wave. Doesn't look good. Second, third, fourth. You can kind of see the shape appearing. Fifth, sixth, it's getting better. Seventh, eighth, I mean, and, and at this point, you can barely even tell the difference, right? All I did is I added a bunch of different waves of fixed wavelength together, and I was able to reproduce this kind of generic function. And you can always do this. Yes? I was going to say from the previous slide before, like with those different types of waves, I started to notice it's kind of like flattening. Good. What is that what like is trying to form when you're adding all those waves together to make this one wave here? Yeah, so let's, let's so that, yeah, so 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 what he's pointing out is that it's hard to see this, but the 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 the, way, the, the function that just has one wave in it is much bigger than the one that has two, and you can kind of see that the amplitudes of these waves, as I increase the wave number, is getting smaller and smaller. Right. Um, and that's that's, that's actually basically because I picked a particularly nice function to Fourier transform. Um, but the, if you pick a nice enough function, and wave fun quantum mechanical wave functions have to have those nice parts, they basically have to be smooth, they can't jump around jaggedly, then you will always have this and it gives you nice convergence properties. And the, you know, there, there's a whole you know, centuries of mathematical literature on what exactly is happening here. But again, I want the punchline to just be you know, it works, right? I add up a bunch of waves, and I can reconstruct it. So what does that mean? What that means is that having, an, having a wave function, if I know this wave function, that's the same information as knowing the amplitude of the contribution to each wave. Okay? That's important. So the wave function in position space has the exact same information, no more, no less, than the information of how much, what's the amplitude of each wave that I have to add together to reconstruct the original guy. So this again is just a, some wave of some fixed wavelength a, as a function of x. Now that was a picture where I had a, a continuum uh, story. But again, when we're talking about these quantum chains, remember, there isn't a continuous variable here. It's an integer, right? i minus 1, i, i plus 1, etc. And what that actually means is that since we're looking at this change, since we're looking at this change, you don't need all possible wavelengths. So in that previous example, I had to fit waves of wavelength one, or I had to, I had to fit waves that had uh, one wave, two wave, three wave, etc., going all the way up to infinity. I had to include all wavelengths possible. Since in this case my position is discrete, I don't have to do that. And that might sound very strange until you just try plotting things. So this is just a plot of two different waves. So I'm using this in the simple trigonometric cosine representation. So it's cosine of k times x, where k is just 2 pi divided by the wavelength. And I have two plots shown here, one where k is just some random number, and the other where k is some random number plus 2 pi. Right? And these plots, as continuous curves, look completely different. right? But if you zoom in and you say, what are their values at 0, or 1, 
or two, or three, or four, they exactly agree. Okay? Because I was able to take this momentum, k, and shift it by two pi. And if I had shifted it by four pi, this purple curve would be even more squunched in, but it would still agree on all of the integers. And people here who remember their high school trig might remember that this is a simple consequence of the sum rule. If I have a cosine of a plus b, I can expand it. And a few hops of algebra and the fact that n is an integer and i is an integer guarantees that adding this 2 pi does not actually change the result. Okay. This is important, and I want to emphasize it. So when I'm talking about waves, because I'm only looking at what the wave looks like at discrete points, there's no difference between looking at a wave with momentum k and momentum k plus 2 pi. This, of course, should be a 3 pi. I'm not sure what happened there. All right. In the following sense, if I build something out of a wave, and that wave has wave vector k, and I try to build the same thing out of the wave vector k plus 2 pi, they're equivalent. And what does that mean? That means that I can take this interval from 0 to 2 pi, and 0 plus 2 pi is 2 pi, so these two points are identified, right? So I can just take, pull this interval out of here, so this is again momentum space. I pull the interval from 0 to 2 pi, and since I told you that 0 and 2 pi have to be identified, this isn't an interval, it's a circle. So this is very important and very different than usual, the usual way we think of momentum in continuum physics. Here, momentum lives on a circle. And it's going to be important, for topological reasons, that it really lives on a circle and not the infinite plane. Are there any questions about this? Because it's important, and I want to make sure everyone's clear on it. So, we're, so what you're trying to do, you're trying to show us that we're looking at this from a trigonometric point, uh, sequence, and that you're saying that these, uh, this point, which are these integers, are lying within that circle? The, the, the idea is that I can describe any, any function at fixed integers right. in terms of a, a mode decomposition for momenta that lives on the circle, not the whole line. Oh. That's the idea. This is, you, you, you may have at some point heard in a math class that you know, if you Fourier transform something that's periodic, you only have to have integer quantized wave vectors. This is basically the inverse of that, right? So, since we have this nice picture of momentum, let's just ask, okay, I have my simple spin chain. What do electrons at fixed momentum look like for a given Hamiltonian? And I'm not going to go into the details of what model I'm going to pick. For a given Hamiltonian, it's easy to show that a wave function at fixed momentum is a nice constant energy state. But the details of the Hamiltonian can be complicated. And what often ends up happening is that you get a solution to Schrodinger's equation where the energy is just some complicated function of k. The only rule for what this thing has to look like is that k of 0 has to equal k of 2 pi, right? Because it has to be periodic because k lives on a circle. Or when I plot things, I'm usually actually going to go from minus pi to pi instead of 0 to 2 pi, but it's not really that different. So if I put back the time dependence in, that means that psi, well, I, I, it, it's some fixed wave vector, so there's some you know, uh, oscillatory behavior as I increase n from you know, minus 1, 0, 1. And then there's this simple time dependence. Okay, but this is formula, so let's just see what this looks like. So first, let's look at wave function for an electron at fixed momentum. And I'm going to pick some generic positive momentum. And let's just see what it does as we go forward in time. Well, it's clear, right? This is moving in this direction. Now, to make it easier to follow what's happening, I'm, the blue points are the actual only information in the wave function, but I'm just drawing the continuum curve to make it easier to follow. All right, so that's k at positive momentum. We see it's moving to the right, OK? What about negative momentum? Well, let's not be too surprised. At negative momentum, it looks like it's moving to the left. All right, so so far, so good. This seems reasonable. What if I just set the momentum to zero? It's not going anywhere, right? It's basically staying put. 
What if I make the momentum pi? Remember, 0 and 2 pi are the same. What about that intermediate point? Now, this looks misleading, right? Because the red curve is clearly moving in one direction. But the blue points aren't actually going in a wave. Let's make that clear by removing the red line. And let's just ask what happens as we evolve. And all that's happening is that these guys are sloshing up and down, right? There's no actual wave propagation to the left or the right. And to convince you that this isn't just a big trick, if I make k some generic number and I take away the red line, it's still pretty clear that there's a wave front moving in this direction. So what does this mean? This means that for these complicated systems, momentum is not actually just mass times velocity anymore. It's something more complicated, because I showed you a wave that had momentum non-zero, but there was clearly no group velocity propagating. And those who remember uh, basic wave mechanics may recall that the group velocity of a wave is related to the dispersion relation. So here is this generic plot. This is actually the dispersion relation I used to make those figures. And so here the idea is that here is my momentum. It goes from minus pi to pi, and it just has some funny shape. right? It goes over here. And what that means is that the velocity is not just a nice linear function. Now, for small momentum, it's clearly true that if I have small positive momentum, I have something that's moving a little bit, and it goes faster and faster the more I increase my momentum. But at some point, this turns around, because I know that I get, when I get to k equals pi, the velocity has to hit 0 again. Now, this is a particularly nice example that I've, I've, I've picked a curve that's well behaved enough that positive momentum corresponds to positive velocity, and negative momentum corresponds to negative velocity. But that's not even generically true, right? If this were some crazy wiggling thing, its derivative would be some crazy wiggling thing, and it's just kind of a complicated mess. So when you sit down and you actually try to solve this problem for some particular material you're interested in, you just have to sit down, grind out what these energy bands look like, and then you can figure out what the velocities are. So what that means is that if I take an electron at a wave vector of this value, even though it has the same velocity as an electron with wave vector this value, even though they're very, very different. And this mapping between momentum and velocity is now just much, much more complicated. Um, so you should be careful when I talk about things at fixed momentum, in particular an electronic state at fixed momentum, that's, that's conceptually different than an electron moving at some, at some you know, proportional velocity along the lattice. Okay? It's, it has a fixed velocity, but that velocity can be some weird looking thing based on what you think the momentum is. All right. Are there any questions about this? Is that the partial derivative? Is that what yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So the, the group velocity is just the first partial derivative of the dispersion relation with respect to momentum. Okay. And if I had more direction, it, so this was one dimensional, so velocity is just a number. Okay. If I was in higher dimensions, velocity would be a vector, but energy would still be a number, and so the velocity in the x direction would be the derivative with respect to the x momentum. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about what this looks like in higher dimensions uh, more, but these are just easy plots to draw, and I think will hopefully give you a flavor of what we're looking at. So again, remember something that I've harped on a lot is that because of the Pauli exclusion principle, you can't put more than one electron in the same state at the same time. And when I talk about this curve, of momentum versus energy, the whole point is that every point on this curve corresponds to a different electronic state. And here, I'm neglecting issues of spin. Uh, if I have, say, spin orbit interactions, I might have another band up here, and this is some linear combination of spin up and spin down, and that one is as well, but let's just take this simple toy model for, for the moment. So we want to make the lowest energy equilibrium state to start with, right? Because if I take my system and I let it sit still, and I try to cool it down to as low as temperature as possible, it's going to want to be in the lowest energy state as possible. Otherwise, it will you know, radiate away energy and, and make its way to that lowest energy state. And so how does that work? 
well, I have a sample, I have some number of states, and I have some fixed number of electrons. And so we just need to fill in states starting from lowest energy up until we've used all of the electrons that we have in our sample. The number of electrons, of course, depends on the details of what my ionic lattice looks like and so on and so forth. Um, so, but, but let's, let's not worry about that too much for now. So here I have this picture. And so the lowest energy state is this state here. And then the next lowest are the two on its sides and the two on its sides and, and so on and so forth. And as you start filling it in, let's say I'm just filling them in until I run out of electrons, right? And so I have some picture like this, that for whatever given number of electrons I have in my system, these states of lowest possible energy up to some cutoff, the cutoff is given by when I run out of electrons. These are all occupied. I put my electrons all in those states, and these are all unoccupied. There are no electrons there. Okay? Again, the details of how I figure out how many electrons I have to fill in depend on the details of the sample, but you know, if you start with a sample and you know what its lattice structure is, you can figure this out. It's just, it, it can get messy. Okay. So, so here in this particular example, it turns out that, well, you know, the, what is the energy cost to move an electron from here to here? Well, it's very small because the energy difference is small, right? So if I only have this partial filling, it's easy to make excited electrons. Okay. So yeah, this, this was just for one band, which was a cheek. It wasn't even just a cheek because there should be two spins of electrons. It was a cheek for other reasons, right? When I wrote down that toy model, I started with the assumption that there was just one electron state in each potential well. Even that isn't necessarily true. It, again, depends on the details of the material. So for instance, if I have some ionic potential well, it might not just be that there's one uh, electronic bound state in there. There might be two. And if I have two in there, that means that at every site, I have to keep track of two different electrons. So if I keep track of two different electrons, I wouldn't have one band, I would have two. Because I can write down two different linear combinations of those two electronic states. More generally, the answer is the number of bands you have depends on the number of free electrons in what is called the fundamental domain of the lattice. Now, in, in the original lattice, it was this simple 1D chain I wrote down. I was assuming that every ion on that lattice was the same. And so I only had to keep track of one before I replicated myself. So here's just a more complicated lattice, right? Where it's a chain built out of two different types of atoms. Atom A and atom B. But it repeats itself, A, B, A, B, A, B. All the fundamental domain is, is it's how much of the lattice you have to copy so that when you copy and paste it next to itself, you get the repeating pattern. So in this case, uh, if each of these atoms only has one electronic bound state, then I would again have two bands because there are two different atoms in the fundamental domain. And all that happens when you have more than one atom in the fundamental domain is you have to keep track of more than one band, right? So your bands are labeled by some integer. There's a first band, a second band, a third band, so on and so forth. So, in this boring example, what does that look like? I can get a picture that roughly looks like this, right? So I have one energy band, and I have another energy band. In this particular example, they didn't interact. So in this example, if I had enough electrons to completely fill up this band, but not fill up this band, then that would be an insulator, because the energy cost to excite one of these electrons it means I have to take it from here and move it all the way up here, and that's a big energy cost. So I have to drive a huge voltage to the system to move that electron. Whereas if I had only partially filled this, it's much easier. So these are what the pictures generically look like, is that you have some complicated problem and you get a bunch of different energy levels, and those energy levels depend on this number called the momentum, where here I'm drawing it from minus pi to pi, but again I want to emphasize this, notice that the two ends match because, of course, this is really wrapped up on a circle. So these were all nice, simple, one-dimensional pictures. Because those are the easiest things to draw. Um, and also the easiest things to calculate. If we move and increase in dimensions, then you're just going to have to keep track of one more momentum. Right? Because I had, you know, 
I had waves that depended on a label counting how far I went to the left and one going how far I went to the right. But each momentum still lives on a, on a circle. So you know, here are some generic pictures. So here is a simple copper lattice. It's really complicated in the fundamental domain. You have a whole bunch of different co copper atoms. There are electrons hopping around. This is, what is this? Gallium arsenide, maybe? So this is gallium, and these are arsenide atoms? I'm not entirely sure. I think it's gallium arsenide. But again, the, the idea is that I have this one cube, and this is the cube that I copy paste to stamp together to build up my lattice. And so I just count in this cube how many electrons are there. So those are really complicated pictures. Let's do an easier picture, OK? Here's a simple lattice. There's an x direction and a y direction. And if you zoom in, I'm telling you that you would find that each site has A and B and C type electrons. You can think of those as electrons in different orbitals around here or different spins, whatever you want. But I'm just telling you that there's A and B and C. So now that I have to keep track of these multiple guys, I see that my wave function is, well, again, there has to be this list of what the amplitude for the A and the B and the C guy is. And I've done this decomposition where now, since there's, am I at 0, 1, 2, 3, and x, and in y, there's an n, x, and an n, y, and therefore kx and ky. But the same logic holds that k is identified with k plus 2. Each k is identified 0 and 2 pi. So I have this thing where it looks like I have kx and ky. But this side and this side are identified, and this side and this side are identified. And as I said briefly, that means this is a torus. I hope this picture can convince you. I take this sheet, I cut it out, right? And I say this side and this side have to be identified, right? Those are the rules. So I take those two sides and I glue them together, all right? But also, this side and this side have to be glued together. So I bend them together, and lo and behold, I've made a donut, OK? So this is, we're already getting into the regime of topology. And the fact that this really is this compact surface is very, very important. But so th th this is roughly the picture. Is this clear to everyone? Yeah. Going back to you, you earlier said uh, that momentum is not just uh, um, mass time velocity. I remember that's how you phrased it. And then in your slide, you had a lot of uh, complex math that you uh, evolved around that statement. And I think because I'm not able to follow the math, I'm a little bit lost. Um, is there a concept that this math hangs on that we can say that there's this thing, or however you want to tell me it is, that is a third factor besides the mass and velocity? And what is it? If the answer was there, I missed it. Because of the math. Good, good. That's, that's a good question. So, so the, the answer is precisely with the clock go. No. So the answer, not going into, I mean, there's of course a beautiful math story, but you don't need to know it to know the punchline. The punchline is the following, okay? I have an energy band, which means that at every value of this number k, there's an energy, okay? And there is a rule that tells you if you know this energy, then you also know for each of those states what the velocity of that electron is. It's just no longer the mass of the, it, the, the velocity is no longer the momentum divided by the mass of the electron. It's just something more complicated because these are funny extended objects, okay? Because it's, 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 it's not a point particle moving anymore. It's an extended wave, and extended waves have group velocities. That's all it is. All right, so that additional factor is the energy now? It's not an additional factor. There's no sense here in which Momentum is a mass times a velocity. Mm -hmm. I have a wave, and that wave has a fixed wavelength. And the dispersion relation, which is this thing that tells me what the energy is, the dispersion relation tells me the relationship between the, the uh, since it tells me the relationship between the energy and the momentum, it also tells me the relationship between the velocity and the momentum. But it's no longer a simple mapping between the two. Okay, and just to show you how lost I am, is it, is, is it correct to think that this momentum you're talking about is the momentum of one of these three electrons? No. What is it? The momentum, the, the momentum is one over the wavelength of the wave you're looking at. So whose momentum is it? 
<laughs> so this, that's, that, that's a good point. It, it's really a, 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 an unfortunate nomenclature issue. You should feel free to, everywhere I'm talking about momentum, I can just, if, if you'd be happier, I'll call it an inverse wavelength. That's really all it is. There's a mapping between the width of the wave and how fast it moves. And it's, it's more complicated here. So I, I apologize, I, that, that's probably a poor linguistic thing, but it's something that gets baked into a lot of physics. So yeah, k, 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 is, k is really an inverse wavelength. So when k is very small, the wave is very wide, but the point is that since I'm looking at discrete waves, I can't make the waves arbitrarily short. Because there's a cutoff, right? Because my electrons live on a lattice, so the wavelength can't be shorter than the spacing of the lattice. Yeah? states, 
and I can move it to just one of these empty states, and it can cost as little energy as I want. Okay? So what that means is that it doesn't matter how little of a voltage I apply, there will still be a current running through, and if you remember Ohm's law, the ratio uh, between the applied voltage and the current response is the resistance, and so, or sorry, is, is the conductance, if I got the ratio right, and so it doesn't matter how little of a voltage I apply, it still always is conducting, okay? So the important thing is that the states where I have put electrons and the states where I have not put electrons are very close to each other in energy, so it costs very little energy to excite them. And then you go through the details of seeing that, well, okay, you, you have to work out the thing and say, okay, well, that electronic state I've excited, as I told you, it has some group velocity, which means that it'll propagate some energy with it, and that's how you know the system is conducting. What if I have an insulator? An insulator just means it doesn't conduct, okay? So this is insulating because if I, try, if I apply a, a voltage, remember, a voltage is a unit of energy, so I want to apply a voltage in a weak limit, it's clear here that if I want to make an excited state, I have to apply a large voltage. It has to be enough energy to take a state here and move it all the way over here because remember, this axis is the energy axis. So in the limit where I'm applying very little voltage, much, much less than this, the voltage doesn't do anything because it doesn't have enough energy to hop an electron all the way over here. So in that limit of a weak applied voltage, the conductance just goes to zero because there's no net current, because even though I'm applying a finite voltage, since I'm not creating excited electrons, there's no net current, so I divided by Z is just zero. Because V is finite, I'm applying some finite voltage, I is zero because there's no current flowing, because I can't make these electrons be excited. Of course, if I apply a strong voltage, something will eventually happen, but at that point, you're probably damaging the system. Or I would be damaging the system. Are there any questions about this? <coughs> yeah? Um, I'm getting a little confused. Yeah. You started out with, with a carbon lattice. Yeah. Carbon's electronic structure is rather complicated. Yes. So I started out with carbon because it was easy then to draw. Kept jumping back and forth between a copper lattice. Or silicon. Well, or silicon is as bad as carbon. But then quartz. quartz. Quartz is a simple lattice, but and you know it's What I'm saying is that the the electron behavior for these materials is quite different. And yet you're treating it mathematically as if they were identical. The reason for that is the following. For, for, for many, so the, the reason for that is the following. Of course, copper, the electronic structure of copper and the electronic structure of quartz or wood or you know, any, anything, whether you think it's something that conducts electricity or doesn't, is very complicated. It depends on the details. Right. But you can grind through the gears of the calculation, and the output at the end of the day is one of these plots. Okay? So copper will look something like this. Oh, I will. And, and quartz will look roughly something like this. Okay? The idea is that if I ask about what free electrons I have hopping around in quartz, and I ask how many I have, I just have enough to fill up this band here, and not enough to put any in here. Whereas in copper, it looks like this. Mm -hmm. Okay? So of course, those things seem very complicated and different, but at the end of the day, you're still always solving the same problem. You ask, what types of electron waves can I have on my lattice? How many of those states are there? How many electrons do I have? How do I fill those states up? And so in copper, I see that I fill it up, but I don't fill up the band all the way, so it happily conducts. In quartz, I see that I, that I, that I do fill a band up all the way so that it doesn't conduct. Now again, I'm sweeping under the rug all of the complicated details of what I'm actually starting with because at the end of the day, those details are input to some machinery that gives you the same picture, but you get the same picture in both cases. And so for you know something like uh, yeah, silica, I guess you probably should look more like a semi. By the way, are you assuming a fixed temperature for all of this? All of this is at zero temperature. Oh, I see. That's, that, that's, that's a bit of a cheat, right? Because to be able to say that I put everything in the absolute lowest energy state is really a zero temperature statement. You know that if you're at finite temperature, you have thermal fluctuations, which can mush things around. And so you are not sharply divided between occupied electronic states and unoccupied electronic states. 
That's it. That, that just makes things easier. As soon as I turn on a finite temperature, this all gets blurry and you know messier. And and when you do experiments with these types of devices in the laboratory, you usually are trying to supercool them anyways to see some interesting properties. Thank you. Yeah. So what you're saying is all of these Not specifically, but as an example, copper. And, and the other one yeah. is the state of quartz. Yeah. And there could be something else, and it would be a different, but yeah. it would end up having similar behavior. Yes, yes. And, and, and again, the qualitative features are something that you think of as a good conductor, like copper. If I went through the grinds and, and calculated the density of state and asked how many electrons do I have in to fill it up, mm -hmm. I would get a picture like this. Quartz would look like this. Gallium arsenide would look like this. Right. Those are just examples because those are the easiest examples for me to think about those things. But you kind of these are generically the features you get when you study band theory, band band conductor, band insulator, etc. Okay. So uh, okay, I'm, I'm almost at the punchline, and the punchline is part of the 2016 Nobel Prize. So please bear with me. So these waves that I was talking about are something called block waves. Um, so imagine I have a simple two-dimensional system, and I have some number of different electronic bound states on each site. So I have this picture here. So remember, I wrote the wave function in this way, right? The wave function has some support for each type of bound state that I have. And then this wave part. So this prefactor here is something that I'm just going to call u. And people may remember, as I said last week, that since this is a wave function, there's some normalization condition, right? Since the wave function has some probabilistic interpretation, there's a normalization condition. And if I think of this as just a vector here, the normalization condition is that vector has to be unit length 1. So I drew an example here where this was three sites. But let's cheat and say, well, what if I just have two components? If I just have two components, then u has to be a vector living on a circle, right? Because I told you it was a two-dimensional vector, but its length has to be 1. So u lives on a circle. And remember, u is a function of this momentum. So each state in every band corresponds to some vector on this circle, which means that I don't just have this wave function over each band. I have an angle. Okay, That's important. It's, it's an angle because, of course, it can wind around and it's back to itself. Right? There's no difference between this angle and this angle plus 360 degrees. Now, for, for full transparency, I'm cheating a little bit here in this simplification for this two-dimensional vector to make this easier to understand pictorially. But it's mathematically really equivalent. I have some details about the proper formulation in, in, in the handout. But the, the pictures here are going to be fine uh, for, for what we want to understand. So the important thing is that I have this circle that I'm keeping track of. So when we have things that live on circles, there are things called winding numbers. Okay. So imagine trying to draw a circle on top of another circle, right? You can just lay it directly on top. I can go around twice, three times, etc. So here, I've shrunk the, the circle I'm winding around to zero, and here are some simple examples, right? So if my, if, my, if my string just never goes around it, there's winding number zero. If I go around it once, it's winding number one. Now, I'm drawing this circle in a particular direction, so that there's a difference between winding counterclockwise and clockwise around the circle, right? I could wind clockwise twice, counterclockwise twice, etc. The important thing to see here is that since I'm making closed strings, this winding number has to be an integer, right? There's just no way to wind this circle around a point a fractional amount, right? I either go around once or twice, and so forth, right? So this winding number property is something that has to be quantized, okay? And this isn't quantization in the quantum mechanic sense. This is quantization in a topological sense, right? I can take these strings and I can yank them around and pull on them, but I can never do anything that makes this winding number be non-zero. Or sorry, be, be non-integer. Is that clear to everyone? So I told you that buried in the information of that block wave function on each band is an angle, OK? But that angle doesn't actually have to be nice everywhere. Okay? If I ask about where that angle is pointing, 
You can have vortices. What does a vortice mean? It just means that so here, there's a vortex where if I say, if I look at the direction of the angle, so the angle is a direction on the plane, so I'm just drawing some various places of it. So here I see that the vorticity around this point is I get one unit of, of uh, counterclockwise. Here's an anti-vortex because I get one unit of clockwise if I follow the angle around here. And any curve I draw in this path, as long as I don't do something stupid like cut into a vortex, um, has to, this angle, as I follow it around any curve here, has to rotate by an integer value. So let's see an example. Let's look at the vortex. If I follow this path, and I just unwrap what these arrows are doing, you find that indeed, what is my angle doing? It's just rotating counterclockwise 360 degrees, right? If I look at the anti-vortex, lo and behold, uh, it's rotating. Oh, okay. Yeah, this should be the other way around because, of course, this should be rotating. I apologize. This, this picture is backwards. Think of times going this way, right? It should be rotating clockwise 360 degrees. Um, so, I apologize for that. It's rotating at 2 pi, right? Well, so, so here it is rotating 2 pi, but this picture is wrong. That's my mistake. You should think of this picture as reversed. Time is flowing this way. If time is flowing this way, then you see indeed it is rotating clockwise. Oh, okay. That's, that's just a, a mistake in the slide. I apologize. If I look at a different curve, like say a curve that goes around both a vortex and an anti-vortex, what happens? Well, it starts to wind one direction, and then it goes back, and so the total rotation is zero. So there's a lesson here. I could, that, that, that this is quantized. And what, most importantly, what does this winding tell us? There's this absolutely beautiful paper by Tholess, who, who is one of the people that won the Nobel Prize, Komodo, Nightingale, and Manish, that tells us that that winding number is actually related to Hall conductance, that funny property that I talked about the first, uh, the first uh, week. Imagine that I have my complicated system. I have some number of electronic bands, and I just ask, how many vortices and anti-vortices do I have in each band? And I can add them up. And of course, the number of vortices plus anti-vortices is an added in a signed way. Every vortex counts as plus one. Every anti-vortex counts as minus one. Uh, has to add up to an integer. You can think of that integer as just saying, if I ask what the angle did as I went all the way around this, that's all it's measuring. So you do that measurement, you get a number, okay? So this is minus one, because it's minus one, minus one, plus one, two, minus two, one, so on and so forth. So each band has this particular number assigned to it, and it has to be a number, or sorry, it has to be an integer. It's not just any number. Now imagine that I happen to be in an insulating state in the following sense. When I ask for my system, how many electrons do I have to pull in, put in? And the number is that I completely fill some bands, and there's no partial filling of any bands. And so here I can ask, well, what's the total number of, of vortices in all of my filled bands? And in this example, it's plus one, and I apologize, it's a little difficult to read. But again, it's just plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, is plus one in this example. And the beautiful result of that work is the following. Regardless of the details of the system, right? All I need to know about is to calculate the Hall conductance. Remember, the Hall conductance is I apply a, a, I drive a current in the x direction, and I measure a voltage differential in the y direction, and I can use Ohm's law to calculate what the conductance is. Regardless of any of the details, this quantity, which we saw experimentally, has these beautiful, sharp, rigid integer plateaus, has to be uh, given by this particular integer value up to this overall coefficient in front. Okay? Independent of any of the details. Okay? It's completely fixed. And so this is a sense in which this is a topological property of the system. Because n is topological data, right? I can imagine smushing things around, changing the system so that a vortex moves and moves around, but there's nothing I can do to the system that will change the total number of vortices in each band. So, so this you can think of this 
consequence is something like a generalization of the integer Hall effect that I discussed, discussed previously, where for materials in strong magnetic fields, you found that this quantity, the Hall conductance, was fixed to be proportional to an integer exactly. Uh, and as a generalization of the integer Hall effect, there's actually a sense in which you can take the integer Hall effect and try to put it in this type of description, though I don't want to get into that. And the reason that those Hall conductance plateaus are so robust and so perfectly quantized is precisely because this number n has to be an integer, because the no, there's no way that the number of vortices minus the number of anti-vortices can be anything other than a number, because you're just adding plus and minus ones. And it's just related to this topological winding number. And this was many, one of many things that Tholus was uh, awarded half of the Nobel Prize for, is this very, very important result here. Um, and since I'm over time, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Oh. Enough energy to boil all the water in the oceans in one second. 
So, so, so this, you're, you're making reference to this famous issue in, again, high energy physics, not condensed matter physics, that we, we see this effect of something called the dark energy that drives the uh, inflation of the universe today. And it's something that you can measure indirectly via astronomical measurements. And you get a number. And you can also say, well, I'm going to try to calculate what this should be in particle physics. And you get the answer irreparably wrong. You're off by a factor of something like 10 to the 120, just completely yeah. wrong. And, and the right way to interpret that is that they're doing the calculation wrong. I mean, obviously they are, OK? But they don't know how to do the calculation right. But that's, that's not an issue we have to deal with here. But a, a reason that that issue comes up is that when they do these calculations, they have to ascribe something that's called a UV cutoff. You have to say, at some very high or short distance scale, I don't fully understand what's happening, right? So for instance, at a super, super microscopic scale, you don't understand what the quantum mechanical structure of gravity is, right? And when they do these calculations in particle physics, they say, well, I think I should trust what this should be. I should be able to go all the way up to the Planck scale, which is this insanely high energy scale, and you just complete, get complete the wrong thing. Now, you might ask, do those types of calculations appear when you're looking at these mesoscopic systems? And the answer is yes. But I'm looking at a mesoscopic system, right? I'm thinking about an atomic lattice. So when I'm looking at these block waves of electrons moving through my sample, I know that I don't really want to zoom in to anything shorter than the uh, interatomic spacing distance, because then I have to get into the details of the precise structure of the atom's potential and all of that. And so I, my UV cutoff is much, much lower. And because of that, I don't get these insane blow-ups and nonsense. What we've been watching, or what you've been demonstrating here, is what I'm, I'm trying to relate to the, the uh, computer. It, you're setting up a structure that we can now use for some kind of computation. Can you tie that? Because give us a future view of that. Sure, sure, good. So, so normal computers. Uh, are effectively classical systems in the following sense. Computers, we all know, work in binary, and so you describe a number by a string of ones and zeros. Okay? So let's say you want to try to factor two numbers, or so I want to factor a number, and so how do I factor it? Right? The only way to do it is just to try multiplying pairs of numbers together until I get the right answer. And that's a very hard, that's a computationally intense problem. Right? You have to go through that whole list. And that's because it's classical. Every bit is either a 1 or a 0. And in a kind of hand-wavy language, once things are quantum mechanical, if I don't have a classical bit, if I have a quantum bit, think of it like the electron. The electron can be either spin up or spin down, and it can be a superposition of spin up and spin down at the same time, which th th this, again, is being a little fuzzy. It basically means you can try to do all of those multiplications at the same time and then pick out the one that gave you the right answer. So that's a bit of a cheat. That's not really how kind of quantum computing factorization algorithms work. But there is a sense in which you are doing a lot more things at the same time, cutting down the time cost uh, immensely. But it's crucial that you understand that you're describing these things that you're building things out of in terms of quantum mechanical objects, not classical objects. That's, that, so that, that's, you know, that's why I'm emphasizing the idea that when I have this thing, the electron is a linear superposition of up and down at the same time, that type of thing. Yes? Can I just see that real quick? Um, these campuses didn't work related to really what you're talking about. And so is it Gavin? And somebody else who's doing, I guess, work with so called quantum uh, materials. Yeah. Can you say a little more about that? So, but was it last month? About, yeah, last month was the end of last month. Suppose it, 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 they saw a peak that indicated that um, uh, you could use qubits to, to indicate whether in these lines that you're talking about, you can see whether uh, an electron is being up or down. And it, 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 so I'm, 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 not, I'm unfortunately not familiar with the experiment that you're talking about, but it certainly is true that plenty of people here are working on 
kind of experimental work related to quantum Hall stuff. So again, you know, I, 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 to, to relate it to quantum computing, I say these words about how you know it's very easy to build a quantum computer. You just have to take an electron and say its its bit is whether the spin is up or down. But of course, the real world is much more complicated than that. That's a that's a system that kind of decoheres very quickly. And so you want to try to create instead of a qubit that's just whether the electron is spinning up or down, something that's more topologically stable. Not quite in the sense that I was talking about here, but you can sort of relate it to the topological nature of these vortices, right? If I have this vortex here, I can't do anything, you know, if I, if I wiggle the system around a little bit, I can't get rid of that vortex or change it from a vortex to an anti-vortex. So understanding materials with these topologically robust properties is extremely important to try to construct actual quantum computers because if you don't have some sort of topological protection of your qubit, it will just decohere because you can never make anything at exactly zero temperature immediately. So that's, that's one of the reasons that I wanted to, to emphasize this topological nature because we're going to build on it in the future. Okay. I, uh, I am is doing this the Institute of Monetary Engineering, supposedly these are the two. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're doing a lot of things in the academy. Thank you. Other questions? So um, can we go back to one of your early slides, which I guess is there because of the, uh, it's the foundation of most of this, the, uh, the cartoon of the hydrogen molecule right at the beginning? The hydrogen molecule? Yeah. Good. It's one of your first slides. Yeah. This could be a little slow. <laughs> so this? on the left hand side, the quantum mechanical picture in the three stages there, so if you take the top one, uh, you're expressing pictorially this uh, something related to the probability of where the electron will be detected if you do the experiment multiple times. And in the top section, you have a division where you consider them separate atoms. But I understood from uh, last week that uh, if you do, if you want to be strictly mathematical, that it's, there's no cutoff where the end of that cloud ends. It literally goes out to Mars, and uh, and so that's a something of a simplification. And in the middle section, you have some depiction of some interaction. Um, and what I'm wondering is, do you think of these interactions as having some uh, some determined value where you shift from these separated uh, depictions, and if it gets close enough, then the outer orbits are are interacting. Whereas at a, another distance, it wasn't. Is there a cover? Sure, yeah. So, so, so you you can think of this. This picture is really a time evolution. Okay, if I have two hydrogen atoms and they're very very far away, then this this it, you'd have to wait. Just you you never. You, you died before you saw those electrons act, or so you saw, so you saw those hydrogen atoms finally get pulled together, even though there is an attractive force between them, because of course, as you say, mathematically speaking, of course, you know, there's no place where the wave function goes strictly to zero. But you, you'd never see it happen in your lifetime. You know? so, so the idea is that if I take two hydrogen atoms that you know, I, I pulled apart and I bring them close enough to each other, and I just let nature run its course, I evolve forward in time using Schrodinger's equation, you find precisely this. You find that the, the the electronic cloud, kind of the region where its wave function is 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 not very very small, where it's kind of order one, moves together and they end up getting stuck in this bound state. And you know that you, you have to bring them pretty pretty close because the the distance between the the two nuclei and a hydrogen atom is is, is pretty so, small. So the cutoff is just going to express how close you have to bring them in order to see this result in a finite time, I mean, a laboratory. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the depiction is somewhat misleading in that the, the blue clouds are essentially probability clouds. Of course, yeah, because I can't, I can't, I can't plot the two. So it could be as, as di uh, dispersed as you want at any distance. But it wouldn't show up this way because the, the, the probabilities, the densities are close to close to the object itself, right? Yeah. Yeah. You, you, this, the, uh, of course, as I said before, right, the full 
correct mathematical description of this is not two different wave functions for two electrons. It's one single wave function that depends on two different positions. But that's an extremely complicated thing to draw a picture of. And so I kind of draw this picture of where, you know, if the two electrons are, you know, if one electron is somewhere in here, where is it likely to see the other electron in some average sense? But that's, you know, that's because, you know, every coordinate in this picture is, I mean, I've already cheated and made it two-dimensional, but I can't draw a four-dimensional plot for you. I mean, I could try, but you, I, I wouldn't know what it means, and neither would anyone here. Right, so you, you kind of you squint and say, where are the regions where it's likely to find both electrons? That's what this blue cloud is, which is, of course, much, much less information than is in the full quantum mechanical wave function. But again, that's, you know, that's, that's because when we draw these pictures, we always have to cheat a little bit. And, and you, of course, in chemistry track class, cheat even more because you draw these pictures of these electrons in shells and covalent bonds and so forth. But you know, when you draw pictures like this, it's much easier to kind of start building together molecules. Yeah? The slides ahead, you had a quantum string and the, 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 the chain. Right. That's right. That's yeah. right. And so that's Schrodinger's equation for that. Why is it higher in the middle and not the same? Ah, good. So I, I skipped past it. So yeah, let me let me reemphasize this. So here I have the, the potential, and so the idea is that. When the potential barrier is higher, that means it, it costs more energy for the electron to be there. And I'm interested in low energy states. Okay? Of, of course, you know, if, if, I have, if I have my one-dimensional chain of electrons, it's certainly possible to have one of those electrons whizzing by you know, 10 TeV, not giving a crap about any of this structure. But that's a very, very high energy state that I don't care about. I'm interested in the lowest line, low energy state, because I'm interested in near zero temperature physics. And those lowest line states are precisely ones where, um, when you solve Schrodinger's equation, you find that the wave function has very little support uh, on the walls and a great, much more deal of support in the wells. But that's that's I I, I, I glossed over this, but that's because I'm specifically looking at lower energy states. I think he's talking about the width, not the same. Just want to have. Oh, sorry, the width of this or the width? It's not the same. No, why why is the center well have such a higher problem? Oh, that's that's just a particular solution I picked. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this this could be more peaked here or more peaked here. Uh, you you can kind of think of this as what I am actually drawing is drawing one of those. Uh, finite velocity wave packets moving through, but I drew it at a fixed time. So maybe a step before it is bigger here and smaller here, and a step forward in time is bigger here and smaller here. That's all, yeah. I'm just trying to kind of draw something very generic. The, the, the real takeaway from this picture is small here, big here. Uh, because that wave function never goes to zero, are we saying that, say, a particular electron theoretically could be anywhere in the at a, at a pedantically mathematical sense, it is true that, you know, if, if you want to dig into the guts of it, that yes, there is a very, 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 very small but non-zero probability to find, you know, any molecule anywhere. But, you know, the, once, the, the, again, the punchline is that when you do things in a lab or, you know, in a big accelerator, it doesn't matter, there are time scales involved. Right? And so, you know, if you would have to repeat the measurements, you know, a billion more times than you have time in before the heat death of the universe sinks in, it's easy enough to just say ignore it, right? Because, because you know, in, in real systems, you always have that sharp cutoff, right? It's a little misleading to see, you know, philosophically, of course, it's there, and maybe you get extremely lucky and you happy to see that very rare event, but they're rare events because they're rare. 